Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Mike Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Lopez. Thanks for tuning in. So we're going to jump right into it and ask, what is your favorite story from the outdoors? My favorite story from the outdoors. That could be like a, can a be photo expedition. Film expedition, photo expedition, just time away, fishing oh. trip. Okay. I think my favorite one, it was just recently, it was this last year. I decided to take six months off, do a passion project, and I traveled to three different like remote locations in Alaska that had never been filmed at, and my family had remote camps in each. So I went to this one place and we had these two little bears and normally, I'm sure Michael, you film bears. They always want you to do the little spring cubs or the big bad male. And since it was my own project, I got to focus on these two teenagers that had just left mom. Um, they might've been a little bit too young to be away from mom. And they were trying to figure out on their own how to fish, how to deal with other bears. And it was just I've, I've never gotten to connect with young bears like that because usually it's kind of those little annoying boys that are bugging you while you're filming the little spring cubs, but getting to spend a month with them. And we had this moment where they didn't trust us because they hadn't seen people. And the little girl came up to us, kind of checked us out. The little boy started huffing and standing up and then she just sat down and ate a fish and he kind of calmed down. He was like, okay, you know, this is okay. So I think that's my favorite experience was kind of making that connection with bears that I normally wouldn't get to film. Okay. And that's going to bring up a whole bunch of other questions. But first, <laughs> but first I want to clear one thing up. Yeah. Right out of the gate, you're being interviewed by three guys and your first story is you're always being bothered by the <laughs> annoying little boy. <laughs> yeah. The little, little teenage boy bears tend to be the ones that like to test the boundaries. So it's always the little annoying boys. I cannot disagree with you there, <laughs> but I, I just want to make sure we were all on the same page here. We are. We are. We're all on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Aaron Rainey and you are out of where? Um, I'm in Washington at the moment. I usually base out of Washington six months a year and Alaska the other six months. So I have a place in both of them. Okay. And it sounds like you have multiple places in Alaska. <laughs> yeah. So we have, we have, um, kind of a main base that we stay at, but then I also have a commercial fishing cabin that I share with my dad and my sister in Igigik, Alaska. And then my uncle has a lodge in Cordova, Alaska, an adventure fishing lodge. And then we have some little cabins all around too that my uncle and my grandma and my grandpa all own. So a bit all over the place. Awesome. So you kind of grew up in Alaska then? Well, we moved down to Washington when I was in elementary school to live on my family's tree farm because my great grandma passed away, but we kept going up commercial fishing every single summer. So we'd spend the entire summer fishing up at a remote camp and visiting all my family because all my family's up there and then school in Washington. When... So this is a question we ask everybody when, I mean, obviously you have an outdoors background. That's a common theme with us. Everybody that we talk to, when did you first pick up a camera? I didn't actually pick up a camera with wildlife until after I graduated with a wildlife ecology degree, I went to Madagascar to do field work and I picked up a DSLR and took it with me for fun and just got addicted to it. Cause I brought the images back to my mom's elementary school. And the kids got so excited about lemurs in Madagascar that they checked out every single book about them. And I was like, oh, I can use images and visuals to bring science and in, in wildlife and make people who can't because it's a small town. No one travels that much. And, and you know, taking these kids to places they'd never get to go otherwise and, and fall in love with those places and care about those places. So that was kind of what got me hooked on cameras. And even in big towns, not very many people have been to Madagascar. <laughs> yeah, I was a field technician. We lived in the rainforest for three and a half months, three months. It was amazing, intense, and yeah, it was incredible. Lots of leeches, though. That was less incredible, but <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> but that's all part of the gig anyways, right? It is, yeah. All right, before we go any further, Ron, you better tell everybody who's on the podcast well, we've oh, got two. We've got two true. old guys and, and a teenager. <laughs> yeah, three three old guys. 
No, no, no. Two old guys and a teenager. <laughs> oh, yeah. I I am a lot younger than you. Yeah. <laughs> and we have Aaron. And so, yeah, Jason's coming to us from Utah. We're all at home, mostly complying <laughs> with uh, the restrictions that are in place currently. I've been spending a lot of time with turkeys. Jason's been running around with wild horses. And Michael's been chasing turkeys a little bit as well, I believe. And Aaron, have you been... So you're in Washington, but have you been able to get out at all? Yeah, so we have a tree farm. So it's about 300 acres, and we have deer and hummingbirds, and the black bears are coming out. And so I have camera traps everywhere and kind of exploring this area a bit more than I normally do. Normally when I come here, I'm like, oh, just lay down and relax and go on walks and stuff and take a break from the camera. But now I'm actually exploring it a bit more. Having some fun. Yeah, it's been good. And are they blacktail deer where you're yeah. at, or is that? Yeah. I know there's a cutoff somewhere where the mule deer stop in Washington and the blacktails. The come east coast, west coast. Coastal, coastal, yeah. Or east side, yeah. west side, not coast. East side, <laughs> west side. Well, let's back up a little bit and go into your. So you said you started with a DSLR, but I know for a fact that you shoot with the red. So that was like what? How how long was that progression? Was had to be pretty fast, right? Well, I see. I graduated, went to Madagascar, ended up going to film school for my master's for a year over in England, and then bought it shortly after that. So I'd been commercial fishing since before, basically right after I walked, my dad threw me out on the net to pick weeds out of it. So um, I have my own set net site in Igigik and had worked and worked and saved and ended up buying a red right away just because... You know, sometimes it's hard to break through. There's so many different camera people. And I was like, well, I have, if I I have have access to all these different places, I need a good camera. So I just kind of went for it. I'm like, well, this is what I want to do. So I love it. it. That's the way to do it. And commercial fishing is pretty good money. Yeah, it can be. (laughs) It can be. It can be pretty bad money too, right? It can be. It's the extremes. It's good or bad. Right, right. I've followed you for a long time on Instagram. And you've seen that progression of telling the stories. And you, going to school in England, did you have a lot of influence with BBC or did you get a lot of chance to work with people that work there or have influence of some sort? Yeah, it was a really, it was really great for networking. I think, you know, like wildlife filming, a lot of it's based in Bristol, England, and they introduced us to all those people. And I think that helped quite a bit. And it kind of got my feet wet to filming. I had no idea what was going on. So it was a good way to just have like a good introduction. And then right after that, I ended up getting mentored by Mark Emery, who is in Florida half the year, Alaska the other half of the year, and just kind of went from there. And it was, I think the master's program was great for just an introduction, like introduction to filming, but being on the ground with Mark taught me so much more about camera and kind of that kind of stuff. Well, he's been doing it for a long time and he's, uh, Uh, he's got all kinds of credits to his name. Yeah, yeah, he's great. He's awesome. I love working with him, and he's he's like family. He and his wife Mary always take me in, and I visit them in King Sam in Alaska and stuff. So, so how did you meet Mark out in the field? No, so I was at Jackson Film Festival, and funny enough, his wife Mary works for Fish and Game in the summers, and she does the announcements over the radio. So for the past twenty years, I've been listening to his wife announce my fishery openings. So while I was at Jackson, I heard this voice and I was like, where is that? Like, that's so familiar. And I got chatting with them and we realized that she's the voice of the radio. Maybe you can explain that a little bit more as far as the voice, because I don't think people totally understand how that works with the fishery opening. Yeah, so every single day you listen to the radio at noon or one and you get an update on what your openings are. So they don't actually, you don't get like a flat opening every day. They look at how many fish have escaped, how the run's doing, and they open you up based on that. So every day you listen to the radio. So they'll say, oh, this is the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Um, Your opening is from noon to 8 p.m. or something like that. So She's the voice that we're always sitting around the radio trying to trying to wait for. <laughs> it sounds like you've just got such a great opportunity to go to a lot of different places. And so Madagascar was one. You spent quite a bit of time in Alaska, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, what other places have you been? Have you been to Europe and done stuff over there? I haven't you- filmed in Europe. I've been down to the Subantarctic twice. Um, we sailed down there from the Falklands down to South Georgia. You know, I've been 
to I'm trying to think of all the places. I've been to South America, been to Africa, and I just took a I took a, like a month off and went and hiked the coast of South Africa with one of my friends. So, wow. Very a bit cool. of everything. <laughs> the entire coast? Not the entire coast. No, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have enough time for that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that trip to to sub Antarctic because you. I think you were working for, who was it that you were working for? Because you guys were doing some pretty amazing underwater stuff, right? Well, so that wasn't underwater. So that was on the Nautilus. So I'm also a video engineer. I contract with the Nautilus who does, they do ocean exploration. So they send down um, remotely operated vehicles and I control the cameras on them. Um, So they have an ROV pilot that'll go down. It can go down quite deep. So I've done three different expedition seasons with them. This sub-Antarctic, that was the first time around I went as a camera assistant for Bertie Gregory for his show um, Resurrection Island for National Geographic. And the second time, I'd actually, the the captain and I got along so well that I joined her crew and uh, was one of her extra hands and then ended up having a BBC film crew on board and join their crew as well. So I was both boat and camera team. So that was a really busy two months of my life. I bet it went by like that. It did. Yeah, it really did. It was, it was incredible. The captain, she's, she's amazing. She's the one I hiked in South Africa with, but just an awesome woman. I learned so much from her. And then on top of that, filming with John Aitchinson, who's a legend in camera was, was really good too. It's a pretty amazing, amazing run going from, you know, halftime tree farmer, halftime fisherman to jump and write it. I mean, it's like learning to swim by getting thrown into the deep end. It is. To be <laughs> completely honest. That's a, that's a big jump really fast. Yeah. It's, it feels fast sometimes. But you've, you've had opportunity to mentor with some world-class cinematographers and photographers for that matter. And I mean, how was that? Was that like trying to drink it's, water through a fire hose? It was incredible. It, yeah, it definitely was. And, and they're, but they're all quite humble people anyways. I mean, if you meet Mark Emery, he's the most down-to-earth person you'll ever meet. And, you know, John Aitchinson working with him, he's super kind, super down-to-earth, answers any question you, you could possibly ask. So I think as long as you're willing to shut up and actually listen – you can take in so much from them. I think so often people are trying to prove themselves and show how great they are and they don't actually just take a step back and listen to what the person has to offer Mm -hmm. them. So yeah, I think that's, that's been a big part of it. That is some sage advice right there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That goes for anything, but yeah, I agree that stepping back and just being willing to humble yourself in the presence of greatness and just observe, I think you could learn probably more than you would by, trying to show them what you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, I mean, For realistically, sure. you're probably not going to impress them that much. So you might as well just <laughs> enjoy the ride. <laughs> exactly. So what's yeah. it like being a woman in this wildlife photography thing? Cause there's always been women in it, but it was always skewed more t- towards males, but I see more and more women getting into the photo, video, everything. What's it like for you? Just cause you're just starting out essentially. I mean, you got so yeah. many years to go. What's it been like so far? It's been interesting because filming is definitely more men still. It's a lot more men still, but there are a lot of younger women that are trying to push through. Um, I think photography is becoming more equal quicker than than filming is. Um, it's been interesting. I think the thing is, though, is every woman in my family is is super strong. So, and they did things that you know most women didn't do. My grandma's quite a famous bush pilot in Alaska and was one of kind of the pioneering women in in flight there for bush pilots and so that's what I grew up seeing so I guess it's it's pretty normal and to be honest when you work in the fishing industry nothing no one can (laughs) make comments as interesting as some of theirs have been the filming (laughs) industry is like the industry is a lot more gentle than the the filming (laughs) or the fishing one well we're kind of jumping around on topics here there's so many more questions that I want I know Ron has probably got a million questions about the underwater stuff just because he is a big underwater guy. But what was that like when, you know, how do you become an operator on a camera on an underwater? It's like, oh, hey, I got this job. 
<laughs> you're going to run a camera. It's going to be like out there in the ocean somewhere. You just need to get cool stuff. What, what, explain what that gig was all about. Well, so it started off. So the Nautilus, it's called Nautilus Live. They run a live stream 24 seven when we're doing the dives and they offer a paid internship for ROV engineers, uh, video engineers, all sorts of scientists and everything. So, you know, in filming, it's almost impossible to get a paid internship. And I saw this and I, I met someone who had done it. So I applied for it and ended up getting it. And they, they're, you're right, right away hands on. They have you right, right away in it. And one of the main people that runs this whole ocean exploration trust is actually Robert Ballard, who found the Titanic. So you're around some pretty top notch people, <laughs> which is incredible. And, the ROV pilots are some of the most brilliant people you've ever met. And you have these incredible scientists who know more about a sea sponge than I'll ever know about anything else. And yeah, you're just surrounded by incredible people. And it was just a really amazing internship that turned into something I kept doing. Yeah, no kidding. Describe what it's like to, like, are you guys working at a certain depth or can you be going to like, how, how deep can you go and what do you find at the different depths? So we actually, we stay on the ships. We have a control van and the ROVs are unmanned. So you're in this big But how far van. do they send that, that ROV down? Up to 4,000 meters. Whoa. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. You're going down to that. There's still a lot of species to be found at that depth. Yeah. And it's, it's sometimes it's super exciting. You'll stumble upon something pretty amazing like vampire squids or we had um, a whale fall the last time I was on board. So we were we were going along and um, the navigator, he does the deep sea mapping, noticed something on the maps that was abnormal. And it was this dead whale at the bottom of the ocean. It had bone eating worms in it and it was had octopuses feeding on it. And it was one of the coolest things ever. And everyone gets excited and it lights up in the van. The scientists are acting like little kids that have seen, you know, everyone's just, there's this energy about it and it's all live streamed. So it's, it's pretty cool. You you don't know what you're going to see. Sometimes it's all mud. Sometimes it's a gem. So when you get on a scene like that, do you guys stay for like hours just exploring as much as you can explore? And how long can that ROV stay underwater? Uh, I don't know the exact amount of time, but they can stay quite long. So we are actually in rotational shifts. So you do four hours and then there's another person that does four hours, another person does four hours, and then you do another four. So say I'm eight to four. Or sorry, eight to eight to twelve. I'll be eight to twelve for both the morning and the evening. Um, so they, you go through several rotations often. But yeah, it's just I don't remember what the rest of the question was. No, I, I mean I'm just so intrigued by it. how long do you stay on an event like that? So if you find that well, I mean I'm sure you could just sit there for a couple of days and just <laughs> observe all the different creatures coming in and all the different things yeah. going on and. It, it depends. It depends on the mission. So every single expedition is based on a mission with like a marine sanctuary or a team that's looking for a shipwreck, whatever, whatever it might be. So it depends on the mission. It depends on, you know, what time was allocated to us for it. It's a lot of times they're figuring out on the spot, like we've made this cool discovery. We'll spend an hour or two on it and exploring it and filming it and taking samples. They get permits on the spot get to get samples of it and yeah, so it's it's case by case, really. But it, it's a cool team to be on. It's such a team-oriented thing, too. So, you know, oftentimes when you're in film crews for wildlife, it's like three or four people at the most. But with mm -hmm. this, you're in this big, giant team, and everyone is needed, whether it's the boat captain or the cook or the ROV engineer. You're, like, all part of the, the same cause, and I, I love that. It's a nice change. Oh, absolutely. And you guys can run 24 hours, especially if you're at depth, because there's no natural light down there anyway. Yeah. So you're you providing your own light and just keep running, huh? Yeah. That's amazing. Yep. So we had uh, Jorge Hauser, and he runs a boat. It's called the Solmar 5, or owns a boat. Um, they go over and do great white trips off uh, Guadalupe Island. Oh, I bet that's amazing. And then, yeah, so... Jorge was on here, but he does all natural light photography underwater. And, you know, at the depths that you're talking about, that's impossible. Well, yeah, you don't impossible. have to, you don't have to get down very far for that to be impossible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what have you had occasions? So 
you've done the underwater stuff in Antarctica or the, the sub Antarctic. And have you done the same in Alaska or up so, in the area where you're more comfortable? No. So the, the areas we've done the under where I've done been on the crew for that is in Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, which is off the coast of Hawaii. And hey, then... Mike, can you say that again? Can you repeat that? <laughs> no, I no, I can't even begin to repeat that. Jason? They gave us they gave us lessons on it because it's a cultural site, so we actually had to figure out how to say it and be able to say it on, on live comms, which was really tricky, but it was fun because we all learned to say it. So say it one more time. Papa Hanamukuakea Marine National Monument. Hopefully I said it right or I'm going to get made fun of by them. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't tell you whether it was right or wrong, but it sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah, so I did it there and then I did it off the coast of California and then I'm trying to think and then off the coast of Mexico. So those are the three spots I've done the deep sea exploration stuff. Wow, that is pretty awesome. So let's do you, have, you guys have any other questions on this deep sea stuff? Because I want to get into her project in Alaska, too. Yeah, I kind of want to take a step back. Jason, did you have anything, though? I lost you. No, for no, a no, second. no, no, okay. I did. I lost. I got dropped off. So I missed what okay. you said, but <laughs> OK, you'll have to listen so, to the podcast, uh, and which I will. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to take a step back. So you initially when you did your trip in Madagascar, you picked up a DSLR and used that on the trip. At what point did you make the transition? Are, are you solely a cinematographer now or do you do some still I, photography as well? I do stills for fun. I'm I when I'm on trips it's almost all cinematography but if mm. I'm out and about I'll take photos as like a nice hobby type thing. And how did you make that transition then? Um I went yeah, went to grad school and just started working on it. Oh, I, you I didn't, haven't yeah, you didn't I haven't do been anything before that. Years. No. Okay, <laughs> Not really. Awesome. Yeah. I guess how does that transition happen when you go to film school? I guess you're going to film school, so that's obviously yeah. You know, picking up a video camera, but was there a conscious decision that okay, Stills did this? I can tell an even more in depth story with video. Is that what your process was from going from a undergrad to a grad? Yeah. So I guess in my undergrad, I studied wildlife ecology and. I, I guess I had never thought it would really be possible to be a camera woman for wildlife filming just because I grew up in a small logging town. No one I knew was in TV, but I was obsessed with the behind the scenes in the films and I loved nature films. And then there was just this kind of thing that clicked in my head and I was like, you know, what? I'm just going to try it. I'm going to go for it. And I thought I was too old, but you're never too old to do it. And I wasn't even close to being too old at that time. But you just get these different mindsets in your head where you're like, oh, you know, this gets in the way, this gets in the way. And it's like, no, none of that's true. That's just you making these fake boundaries that don't actually exist. So once I put my mind to it, I was like, okay, I'm just going to go for it and see what happens. Well, it definitely happened. Yeah, <laughs> it did. <laughs> <laughs> You were asking about the project in Alaska. Let's go into that a little bit. You said it was a passion project, so you you kind of developed it yourself. Yeah, so I fully funded it, developed it, planned it, did the, did the whole thing. So I love production coordinators now, the ones that do all the bookings and stuff. I, like, I have so much. I already respected them, but my respect has gone through the roof because I actually brought people with me to help with it because you don't want to be by yourself out filming with bears. And I've done that a lot by myself and it's not the smartest thing. So I brought um, people who are also kind of breaking into the industry and was bought their ticket and was, was like, I can't pay you at this time, but if it for some reason does sell, I'll pay you for it. But if it doesn't sell, you have ownership to all your footage. So we wrote a contract for that and yeah, just, just did everything. <laughs> So describe what this project is, because I saw on Instagram, I think you're still in the edit process right now, right? Yeah. You're, so yeah, you're so post-production now. Mm -hmm. So describe, can you give us kind of a snapshot uh, description as to what this film is going to be about? Yeah, I can. So it's going back to the stories that I heard growing up from my grandma, who's a bush pilot, my uncle, who's a bush pilot, my dad, who's a boat captain. Um, and seeing these places and wildlife stories that they talked about when I was growing up and seeing it from my perspective as a camera person. Um, so that's that's the main thing. So there's three different locations that we're focusing on. One's a remote island where no one else 
is. Uh, it used to be a, well, it has a lighthouse on it still. There used to be lighthouse keepers back in up until the 70s. Um, now it's automatic. So we were the only ones there. That was pretty cool. Um, the other place was Catala. It's an old ghost town. So it used to have 10,000 people there. Now it's just our family camp there. Um, and the forest has kind of taken it over. It's this temperate rainforest. So it's pretty cool to see like nature taking back something that used to be so prominent in the area. And then the last place is the secret river that my grandma used to fish. So yeah, going back and following family stories. That's pretty cool. So how long is this project going to be? Uh, the finished product, is it a 30 minute, an hour long or? It's an hour long. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Give us an idea of how much you shot because I know what it takes to put together an hour's worth of content, right? So yeah. <laughs> what kind of just give us an idea of what was involved and what your expectations were and what you actually came back with. I bought a ton of hard drives. Um, I was really lucky. I have a really good friend. He's a BBC editor. He mostly does BBC contracts. And I actually hired him to do the edit because um, I hate editing. I don't have the patience to sit in front of a computer. <laughs> and he has a really good visual. He and I have worked on several projects together. So he helped me with the data. How much would I need? How many hard drives would I need? And then um, I bought a second camera and my cousin shot on it quite a bit who had never filmed before. So he did a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, my dad joined for part of it. It was a big family occasion as well. My uncle flew us out to a couple locations. Um, but yeah, so we ended up, I think with almost 40 terabytes of footage by the end. So what were you shooting? Like if you're shooting a red, were you shooting 6k or 4k or moving around? Yeah, moving around, but mostly 5.5 .5 to 6k. And then the project will be finalized in 4k. Yeah. Yep. So answer me this, cause I have the same problem. Yeah. How can we have all the patients in the world to sit and wait on one animal? Like we can sit for 12 hours waiting for a bear to do something cool or waiting to see the tail of a whale, right? Yeah. But you sit in an edit bay and it's like, I can't sit here for five minutes. No, I, I am I am the worst person to sit in the edit. And I have been sitting in this edit quite a bit. I went over to England to sit in it for quite a while. And I was on the floor eating a chocolate orange or going and getting more tea <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> look, scrolling through Instagram. And then I, my editor would be like, Aaron, I'm like, okay, sorry, focused again. And we'd go through shots and stuff, but yeah, I can't, it's just, yeah, we, we ended up being super productive, but there was a lot of time of me being like, I'm stuck inside looking at pretty pictures when I could be out doing that. <laughs> So what are your plans for this film? Are you going to shop it around or have you already had some interest in it or are you? We've had some interest. Yeah. So we're kind of, we're working on it. We're just going to keep going. And if it, if it sells before it's done, which fingers crossed, great. If it, if it ends up falling through, then we'll put it in festivals and kind of go from there. I think at the end of the day, you know, you shoot for six months straight, you get significantly better in that and it was an amazing experience so whether or not it does i'm i'm happy i think that's the best way to grow is through these passion projects right because you don't yep. care what the work i mean you'll do a 20-hour day and you just know well that's what i did you know it's not yeah. like you're looking at the clock and saying oh i need to go home when it's passion project like that you just you're in it to win it, you know, and you're just going to stay as long yeah. as it takes. Yeah. And it was, it was, you know, six months straight in remote Alaska. We would come in just to move to the next location, but it was, yeah, it was incredible. And I still did my fishing season for a month, but yeah, just a really incredible experience and being disconnected for that long was super nice too. I wish I was right now, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you got to make that money when you're out, when you're doing that fishing, right? Finding a way to get family involved as well that had to have been a treat for for you number yeah. one being a, uh, the head of the project and that in a sense being the project yeah was, you know family history uh but for them as well being able to it, to be a part of that hey i got to hang out with Aaron. yeah my dad has never gotten to go on a shoot with me and he came out to the island with me for the first for the first bit and he was so excited. He's like a, he's like a kid. He's, he's great. He's so enthusiastic. He's so supportive. And we had, um, we had Orca come in and we didn't expect them to come in. 
and he was jumping up and down. He was like, we had lighthouse watches. So people would watch from the lighthouse in case like we were having dinner or something just to make sure we didn't miss anything. And I see him up there going like this, you know, with his hands <laughs> in the air. And I'm like, oh, oh, we've got whales. So we ran outside to film, but it was just, that was incredible. And then um, I did an interview with my grandma, which the whole thing won't be in the film, but I'll edit it up just for the family anyways. And hearing her experiences as a pilot, you know, the planes were, she had a map on her lap when she was navigating and that kind of stuff. It was just a whole different time period and hearing her experiences as a woman during that time and as a pilot during that time, I wouldn't have sat down and, and maybe asked the same questions if it hadn't been for this project. So that was really, really special too, to actually sit down and take the time to hear these stories because you never know. You never know when you're not going to have access to those stories. Does grandma still fly by chance? She just stopped flying a few years back. She had, to, she had for health reasons, had to stop. But she is still a fireball. Well, I can only imagine. <laughs> she is a imagine. feisty woman, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Where was she based out of? She was based out of Yakutat. Cool. And then what did she fly? Did she fly probably everything, right? Because they all do, you know, from a beaver to an otter to a whatever. All sorts of things, but she started as a school teacher. They lived in, um, I don't remember, I think it was either Haynes or Juno, but she bought a tea craft without knowing how to fly and learned from there while she was a school teacher and just got obsessed with flying and kept going. And she was in the Smithsonian Women of Flight for her flying. Um, oh, wow. She was honored by that. Um, but yeah, just a total fireball of a woman and, you know, a very strong, independent person. Can you imagine flying back then with maps like you got in your no. lap and you're, you know, she's probably flying on floats and on wheels and on skis yeah. and, and everything, right? And the thing I hadn't thought about is how much more accurate our weather forecasting is now and how it wasn't as accurate right. back then. And she had times where she'd suddenly be in a whiteout and she had to land her plane in a whiteout and didn't crash, you know, 100 mile an hour winds before didn't crash. But these things in Alaska, they sneak up on you anyways. But when the technology wasn't as far along, they'd sneak up on you even easier. So when I sat down and listened to her stories, there were all these things I had never thought about. And suddenly, you know, you're completely humbled by your own grandma. You're like, oh, <laughs> all my grandparents are so much cooler than me. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. Mm -hmm. So are you going to have a trailer for this film that we can all watch kind of as a teaser? Um, I will eventually release one. It's It's been, we have one, but we've decided to hold on to it for a bit longer until it's closer to the film being ready. Right. Well, that's completely understandable, but what we'll have to do is keep in touch with you over that because I'm super curious now. I'm, I want to see it all. I want to see the raw interview with your grandma. Yeah, I want to meet your grandma. Yeah, yeah no joke. She sounds an awful lot like mine. Yeah, I want to yeah. go. I want to go hear those stories uh, firsthand. I bet she. I bet yeah. it was amazing. Oh, it it was an incredible interview to sit down and do, and yeah, yeah it, and my grandpa is a helicopter pilot that she's married to, and then my other grandpa because they're divorced. So I I'm lucky enough to have an extra set of grandparents. My other grandpa was one of the Bering Sea crab people for a while, and he's a commercial fisherman. And his wife, my step grandma, still commercial fishes. So they're they're all just super wild people. <laughs> There's a whole film in that too, with just some of these commercial fishing things, right? I mean, that's a pretty colorful thing. It's a it's a colorful <laughs> thing, and it really is <laughs> in more than one way. <laughs> Colorful is a good word, huh? Yeah. I like it. Yeah, it's a nice way to say it. <laughs> so let's talk about gear just a little bit, because I think okay. it's really interesting that you are fairly new to the, like, so what, what year was it that you went to Madagascar? I went to Madagascar, I think it was 2013. So I started film school in 2014. And then you were out of film school and bought your red when? 2015, 2016. So you've been shooting with that for, let's say, four years. Yep. Is that about right? That's about right, yeah. And the learning curve on it is not, I mean, we get a lot of questions, and I think a lot of people are moving into video just because our tools today and the, and the technology today really lends itself to telling a really cool story with video. Yeah. Ron, I shoot tons of video and have for a long time. Ron and Jason are both, you know, the more we talk, the more they're like, so I want to start shooting this, and I want to start shooting that. So... <laughs> 
I think there's a lot of people moving in that direction. Talk a little bit about, it's not that hard. It's very similar to a DSLR, right? And with yeah. your gear, what what are you using for gear in addition to the red? Like what kind of lenses are you using? And the biggest question we get, I think, on this podcast as for video is what kind of tripod should I get? You you want a fluid head tripod. <laughs> I think tripod's one of the one of the most underrated things and one of the most important things you need because once you go from, you know, a pretty terrible tripod to one that's actually sufficient for your camera, the difference is is amazing. But yeah, I I actually, when I'm just shooting on my own, because I, I don't have a ton of money now, <laughs> um, I use a lot of Sigma lenses, the art series. You know, you can use your stills lenses on your video camera, which, which is great. Um, when I'm on shoots and I'm hired for shoots, they send me out with their lenses. So it's a lot nicer lenses then. Um, but yeah, I, I use a, a mi- quite a mix of things. I use the 150 to 600 Sigma lens just when I'm out by myself. It's not great because it extends right. and that throws off your balance. But I think it's taught me how to be even like more efficient when I'm on a good lens because then I'm not worried about the balance anymore. Um, and just tripod. You need something that's stable and has a fluid head and that you can move really smoothly. Which means it's not light. Nope. You don't want a light tripod. (laughs) Start lifting the weights because you're going to be carrying a lot of gear. (laughs) Or cheap. (laughs) Not cheap either. I I just got my first nice fluid head. And I was, in fact, I first thing I did when I unboxed the thing was call Mike. I'm like, this thing is huge. (laughs) (laughs) But you just can't do it. It's essential. I mean, it's one of those things that you just got to have. So, When you're running the Sigma 150 to 600, then obviously you're relying on neutral density, variable neutral neutral density. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. We get that. I'm fixing to do a whole YouTube video on all the different types of neutral density that you can use, whether you're going to put it in a map box or using a variable or you're using the drop-in filters. I thought we would do a whole thing. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah, That's a really good idea. There's so many different varieties and there's so many flavors. And then there's ways to make it easy. There's ways to make it hard. You make it easy, it tends to be cheap, and then you can have problems. You make it hard, then you add more weight, and you got to lift more weights, like you were just saying. So <laughs> when you're out there, it's the variables that you're using. Mm-hmm. The cool thing about Alaska is, what I love about Alaska is, a lot of times it's cloudy. Yeah, I I really like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I also like it cause I'm super pale, so I don't burn when I was in South Africa. I look like a lobster after about 10 minutes, but in Alaska, <laughs> I'm like, this is my, this is my place. <laughs> it's, and it's nice for both photography, filming and your skin. So it's, it's great all around. <laughs> so a little bit further into the equipment, when you said you got 40, what'd you say? 40 terabytes for that project. What were you guys doing when you were off the grid? Did you take a generator with you to for power or yeah, did you have so solar or what did you do? I, I did a mixture. It depended on our location, but I built um, a windmill in one of the locations and solar panel and generator. So I had I was relying, trying to rely mostly on solar and wind, but sometimes that doesn't work in Alaska, as, as you probably know. And then we'd have a fallback generator that we would use. So it depended on the location, but every location we did have a generator just because that's the most reliable one. It really is, right? But there's some new yeah. technology that's coming out that's pretty I know. interesting. I'm, I'm excited to, to explore it more because I wish I didn't have to lug generators out in such beautiful places and have them going every night. <laughs> right. That's a, that's just a, a an evil that you have to deal with sometimes. Yeah. So are you, this, gonna, are you two gonna? Are you two gonna keep it a secret? Or? Exactly. I'm over like, what's this technology? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> <He's hanging. laughs> so you all are familiar with DJI. DJI mm-hmm. makes a their Inspire uh, drone, which is the higher end drone that they sell. They also have the Ronin Two, which is a gimbal, a big gimbal for that would run a red, and it runs on these lithium polymer batteries, and they're significantly lighter than a lithium ion battery, and they charge significantly faster than a lithium Mm -hmm. ion or yeah lithium ion but they're kind of proprietary to dji well there's a company in phoenix that just came out with a kind of interface between your camera and that battery 
So if you can just get that interface, now you can use these DJI batteries, which are lighter weight. Mm -hmm. They charge faster and they're cheaper. Yep. So I think with all of those things built in, they're not even out yet. You could pre-order it. I guess it's out on uh, the end of April, supposedly. So last night I was like, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to buy it. For me, it's the weight. You know, if, if you're going to go hiking and go after bears or moose or whatever, and you have four batteries in your pack, that's, what would you say, Aaron? Weight-wise, that's at least 10 pounds yeah. of just yeah. batteries. So it gets heavy. <laughs> with, with these new batteries, you can cut it to probably seven pounds, maybe yeah. six pounds. So it's mm -hmm. just a significant savings. And then the speed in which they charge some of these other, the old style lithium ion batteries would take, I don't even know, let's just say three or four hours to charge. Whereas these new lithium polymer batteries will actually charge in 45 minutes to an hour. Oh, wow. So mm -hmm. significant. And they actually are temperature regulated, self temperature regulated. So if they get too cold, they can generate their own heat which mm -hmm. keeps the efficiency of the battery up which is really nice yeah so we'll have to do it when i get it we'll do a little pro tip on it because it's it mm. could be a game changer we'll just have and to then see solar panels seem to be improving and getting more accessible all the time so hopefully that that keeps improving we've we've always had um solar panels in our remote camps like in the last 10 years or however long we've they've been available but it's kind of like, for me, it was trying to figure out what ones would be the best. And it's really hard to navigate. There's no like place where you can go look and be like, where, when I'm remote camping with my red camera, which solar panel should I bring? There's not really a lot of information out there. So it was a lot of trial and error when I was out there. Being in Alaska too, right? I mean, with the sun not shining as much, that can always be a channel with solar, right? And and, and a lot of times those solar panels, to, to charge all your batteries in a timely manner, you'd have probably have to have a whole a whole fleet of panels to be able to do yep. it effectively, right? So yeah. yeah, but it's coming along. It is, it's coming along. Yeah. So we haven't talked about this for a long time, but when I win the Powerball <laughs> and we build, the, we build the Wild and Exposed Lodge in Alaska, <laughs> On a site that's yet to be determined. <laughs> I've been looking at these uh, Tesla panels. They basically are the roofing for your house. So you just. They look great. That's the covering and they charge the whole, you can run the whole house off of them. But I'm wondering, you know, at, at what point they're going to have those in a, in a portable format. There's a lot of good options, like you said, Aaron, mm -hmm. right now, but that seems like a pretty phenomenal technology that you could use to for several different purposes now yeah. you know when you're doing projects like the one that you did mm -hmm. i think the biggest problem in alaska too is you know and aaron can testify to this is there's all these things that you can do and you could take 10 panels with you but then that means you get another flight right so yeah. that means you got to <laughs> yeah. pay for another, you another plane, bush plane. <laughs> coming out and you don't just pay for the one way for them to bring it out you have to pay to get them back too so yeah. all of a sudden these costs of, of a production like that start going you know, you think, oh, I'm going to save because I'm not going to use this this fuel to run the generator. But really, you are because you're going to have to fly that plane back. And so it's going to use fuel. So it's it's just something to keep on the radar. And the more efficient the stuff gets, the better it's going to be. But it's just getting better and better every year so far. I think there is, too, people, especially because I worked for my uncle's lodge for a while. And I'd help set up shoots. And I was a guide for it. But I'd have production companies call and they were always in shock at the cost of Alaska. Right. And I'm, I'm like, I can't, I can't make it any cheaper for you. I'm sorry. Like I don't, there's no magic way to make this less expensive. I mean, a lot of these communities have to fly or barge in all their goods. And I think if you ever plan to take a trip, whether it's, whether it's photography or filming, do plan on it being a bit more expensive. There are parts of Alaska, you know, King Salmon, where milk's like 10 to $12 a gallon on a normal year. So it's it's interesting talking to companies because I'm like, it's it's going to be more expensive than you think. Just double or triple it. Well, see, yep. Ron, when you win the Powerball, then you need to buy a boat too because then you can, you can right. barge some stuff in for people <laughs> and make money and then you can exactly. also have something for all of us. And trade <laughs> trade access and information. I'm good with that. There you go. What is up for this year? Now, we're all dealing with the COVID-19 thing right now. We're at stay-at-home. You, I think, would be in Alaska if it wasn't for this COVID thing right now. 
Yeah. What's your plan? Are you going to try to get to Alaska? And then when you do, what are you going to do? Or what's the summer looking like for you? Well, I, so part of me is, is dying to go up and start shooting. But the other part of me recognizes that I don't want to be the person carrying the problem into a small community. And a lot of these small communities were really hit hard in the 1918 flu. So they're really cautious right now. They're being super careful. So I'm having to hold and sit tight for a while. And I will go up in early June for fishing because I'm considered an essential worker for that. But until then, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to just sit tight here. It's tough. I know, right? It's really hard, especially when, you know, there's a place waiting for me there. But, you know, it's, I don't think it's worth it to bring it into a small community. So let's say you get there and it's kind of died down and it gets better. Are you, do you have a filming plans for like July and August and on into the year? Are you working on something? So so I am on a project. I can't, I can't actually talk about it yet, but I I have been hired for a project that's, that's going to be filming over the next year all all over the world. So, yeah. I'm a little jealous. I have to be honest. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a lot jealous. (laughs) I'm open to a paid internship. (laughs) Doesn't even have to pay that much, really. (laughs) Let's wind this up with this question. What advice would you give to a younger person that's just getting into photography? You know, you're a lot like me. When I got out of school with with a degree, I didn't have any clue that you could do this. Yeah. Right? But had I had that just a little bit of nudging early on, I would have probably got into it even sooner than I did. So what advice do you give younger people that are thinking, you know, because we get a lot of requests from younger and you see a lot more younger people on Instagram that's, you know, young wildlife photographer, I really want to get in. And you look at some of their stuff and it's like, wow, that's pretty good for being 13 years old or pretty good for being 14 years old. What advice do you give these younger people? Just be stubborn. You're going to have people telling you all the time what you can't do. For some reason, people love to, to bring that up, but it's you just have to be stubborn and keep going and if it's what you want to do just go for it i had so many people tell me what a terrible idea this passion project was what a waste of money it was how they didn't think i could go live at a remote camp or set anything up and i just kind of was like whatever (laughs) i'm gonna do it anyways (laughs) had those people met you before or were they just yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah but i think i think there is I, i think I try to be careful about how I say this because there are so many great people in the filming industry, but there still is a group of people maybe or some people that if I'm at a film festival and I'm dressed up and I'm wearing a dress, they assume that I can't do anything else. And um, unfortunately, that stereotype still exists. And yeah, so you just have to ignore it. Just You're never going to be everyone's cup of tea. Just be your own. I like it. Awesome. Awesome. One other question. What would you say to some young person that is thinking about school? Is school worth it or is it better to, you know, like I think a degree is worth it always, right? But do you need to go and do the master's program or do you think just saying, you know what, I'm willing to work for free for a couple of years and just get in with some of the the best of the best and learn that way? What? Because I know that there's photographers that'll say they – There's people on both sides of that. And I don't think there's a right or a wrong, but what's your... I was going to say, I think everyone's path is different. You kind of have to look at what opportunities and what resources you have around you and work with with what works best for you. You can't look at anyone else's path and be like, oh, that's the path to do it because that's not true. I mean, I look at myself and I was so fortunate to have, you know everyone in my family being so supportive of me being outdoorsy and me being adventure and, you know, dropping me off with bears in the plane and coming and getting me later. Like that was just, that's what they wanted. They were happy with it. They were happy to do that, but not everyone has that access and not everyone, you know, has access to a mentor right away, but there's film festivals you can go to instead of grad school and you can meet people there. You can network there. So I think it just depends on who you are and what, what is the best way you learn what resources do you have? What opportunities are available to you? And then go from there. But I don't think school's necessary for everyone, but I think that it never hurts to go to school. I think it never hurts to keep learning. And that would be a great statement to end on. But <laughs> I th- so I started, 
you know, found you, started following you on Instagram last year. Mm -hmm. Michael and I were talking about your project because you were posting, you know, about it vaguely from time to time. So we were talking about your project, but you kind of came back into my mind when, when we were kind of working on this Pebble Mine project with Drew Hamilton. Yeah. And listening to you talk about, you know, the, the biological history or the ecological history of Alaska. And granted, you've been around it since you were a kid. So you do have a lot longer uh, time frame to draw from or history to draw from personally. But I think that your undergrad degree, obviously, as well as your field experience and your your time in the field, whether it was biological work or not, has been a huge influence on you, too. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. My parents were actually both teachers for a while. My dad did it for a short time. My mom's still a teacher. They have degrees in biology, so they were always about science. We were always learning about science, dissecting salmon. You know, I knew all five species when I was little, and I think just that science aspect helps me a lot because I, I love the like the idea of ecosystems and how everything's intertwined and how if you pull at one thing, you're affecting all these other things. And in filming, that's not going to hurt to know the science too. It, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt and it gives you a different perspective. And so I think, yeah, I think it's definitely helped me throughout this. And, you know, when it comes to pebble mine, I have the background of being a third generation commercial fisherman. So I know the fishing industry. I've read everything you can possibly read on Bristol Bay fisheries. But then I also know the ecosystems, the bears, all of everything on that, too. I don't know it all, but I basically read about it as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it just every single thing you can bring in can help you. And like when I was working with the boat captain down in the sub-Antarctic, I went to work with her because I saw she's this incredibly brilliant woman who knows how to work hard. She's a captain of a boat in the sub-Antarctic. She goes down to Antarctica and sails. And even though it wasn't directly related to filming and, and or photography, I still was able to see, you know, what she can teach me so much about, you know, my field craft or being outdoors or you know, when you're on a sailboat and something breaks down, you have to figure it out right there on the boat with no help. There's no internet. There's nothing. You pick up a manual, you read it, you figure it out, you tinker. And and that, you know, just because it's not directly filming related doesn't mean it's it's not going to help you. Mm -hmm. you, you. Every single part, you can pull different things from all over to make yourself a better person in the field. Awesome. <laughs> well, I will let it in there unless you guys have any other questions. No, I just want to go filming with you one of these days. Up in Alaska. <laughs> we need to. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what. I mean, I'm, I'm so pumped about your film too. I'm seriously just hearing the, you know, hearing to lay it out. I'm, I'm super excited about it. So thank you. Yeah. yeah I'll keep sure. you guys updated on it for sure. It's, yeah. it's definitely been, been a process, but been a really good process. Before we let you go, shout out your, your Instagram will be up on the video portion of this, but for the audio portion of it, if, if someone's listening via audio, what's your Instagram handle? And then do you have a web page? And then when this film does release, where do you plan on putting like that teaser so that people can check it out? We'll grab it. We'll snatch it up if it's for public consumption on YouTube or something like that. But give us a, a shout out as far as where all those things are. Okay, my Instagram is at E period R A N N E Y. So it's rainy, but it looks like Ranny. And then my webpage is AaronRainy.com. And I will keep you guys updated on where the where the trailer comes out because I don't even know that yet. <laughs> but as Perfect. soon as I do, I'll let you know. Well, it's been fantastic to have you on, Aaron. I really Thank appreciate you, you giving us your time tonight and uh, look forward to seeing what you get done in the field this summer. Thank you. It's so nice to finally be face to face with you guys. I've followed you guys for so long. It's nice to put oh, a face awesome. to the to the photos. Yeah, well, the faces, the photos are prettier than the faces. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to the Wild and Exposed podcast. If you haven't yet, please give us a rating and a review, and make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it. And as always. Thanks for tuning in. Sing along to the radio. We're gonna make it someday. Nothing's gonna get in our way.